Paul, you turn them out on a cold night uh, for a stranger from the mountains. Uh, I think it's really exciting that you're uh, working on charitable things like the Relay for Life. Uh, our ethical society is doing a boycott in which they go, we, we go, I'm a member there too, we go to businesses that pay a living wage in Asheville and preferentially patronize them and let them know that we're there because of that. I was out in Denver speaking to the Denver Atheists about three weeks ago, and they're setting up a charitable organization. All the members are going to give, and they're going to divvy it up between some charities in Denver, and they hope nationwide. Again, making it clear that you can be good without God, and I think those are kind of important. Minneapolis, they're working on something similar up there, so that those kind of ideas are going around. You know, when, um, when a five-year-old has an imaginary friend who gives him bad advice, and gets him into trouble. We counsel the kid, and uh, sometimes these days we drug the kid um, to, you know, to straighten things out. When a 55-year-old has an imaginary friend who gives him bad advice that gets him into trouble, we elect him to office in this country. <laughs> um, I'm one of only about four or five people who are, who are really out nationally about being, and there may be a few more than that, but I think we have one member of Congress, um, a couple of city council members here and there, but not many. And the reason is that, as you all are quite aware, uh, atheists are looked on as the least trustworthy people in our culture. We fall way down on most, most scales in popular opinion. And of course, as we all know, that, that's kind of weird because uh, we tend to be more ethical than most people. There are fewer of us as a percentage in prison we stay married longer. Uh, we commit less murders. We go to school longer. School uh, countries in the world that have a higher percentage of non-theists have the highest percentage of educated people and the least crime. So it's kind of weird, but we're going to overcome that. Uh, Sean Fairclough, who I spoke with, and um, he came down to Asheville to visit us, is, is pushing for this secular decade that in, in 10 more years we're going to really have made an impact. We're going to really shift the ball. And I think it's happening more and more every day. The numbers of your group expanding, the groups like this are expanding across the country. And for my story, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I happened to get here. Because uh, it's, why would y'all show up for a first year city council member in Asheville? Lord, there's a little town way out there. You know, you made vacation out there once in a while. Barack did. Uh, but I mean, I, I, I gained notoriety way beyond what any first year city council person in Asheville would ever have come up with, and I sure did not see it coming. So I'll tell you a little about how I got there. I was an investigative reporter for quite a while, and an editor, and during a stretch of my, of my time, starting in 2002, I was covering a really crooked sheriff in Asheville. Uh, he's now spending 15 years in federal prison sharing a prison with Bernie Madoff. Um, the federal prosecutor, after the trial, which was in 2007, came to me after the trial and said, you had the story first. In fact, I learned from witnesses that, people, that the FBI and IRS were showing up at the door of witnesses carrying my newspaper articles to confirm that what I had written was accurate. He went down for organized gambling and extortion and mail fraud and other fancy things. And uh, among other things, when he, he was voted out before he got busted, when a sheriff leaves office in North Carolina, they, they audit the evidence locker uh, to make sure for the new sheriff, you know, wants to know that everything's in order. When they audited the evidence locker, 327 weapons were missing. Drugs from 1,300 <coughs> cases were missing. 16 rape kits were unlabeled, makes them useless and over $200,000 in cash was missing. Um, he had a real, real big racket going. Well, okay, I left the newspaper, I decided to run for office. Uh, in the middle of, well, I, I won the primary. We, we have an open primary in Asheville. And there were 10 candidates, I came in first. And I think that surprised people in town because I'm known to be uh, fairly liberal and, and quietly known. Before that, nobody much cared about marijuana. Porters, they said, uh, waiters and waitresses were using marijuana, all this stuff. Vilify it, make it sound bad because of the moral issue, but the whole point was a commercial interest. 
It was a commercial interest in suppressing the hemp industry and, um, and permitting the tree pulp industry to, to flourish. Well, they were real successful with that. They got marijuana banned in 1915 as a narcotic. Uh, cocaine was suppressed, but it actually wasn't maybe illegal until the 1980s in the United States. It was, a, it was actually a legal drug because it's not a narcotic, it's a uh, stimulant. Uh, along the way, uh, heroin and the opiates were, again, the pharmaceutical companies really were concerned to control the opiates because they wanted to have control of the financial control. But there was that moral suasion of it's bad. So we come to today, and, and there's over and over again, you read in the newspaper, the drug problem, the drug problem, the drug problem. There is not a drug problem. There's a crime problem. There's a black market problem. We have gangs in the cities that we've been, you know, but when did we last have gangs in cities? During alcohol prohibition. When you have a black market, there's a reason for people to carry guns. Because if you, can't, if you get your dope stolen, you can't go to the police. So you have a pocket full of cash and you have dope on you. You want to protect it, you carry a gun. You get together with other people, you've got a gang. It's exactly what happened. Elliot Ness and the Untouchables and Al Capone and everything. Prohibition is ever thus. We've been allowed ourselves to be sold the idea of prohibition, starting from that moral core, but fomented by commercial interests, to where now we have a drug war going on in Mexico. We have the Taliban being funded by heroin. We have the prison industry. We have the largest number of people Per, per capita in the world in prison in this country. We're breaking up families. We get people put into prison, largely non-white, but are a high percentage of non-white, into prisons. They come out, they can't get jobs. They can't support their families. We've broken up the families and the communities. And all of this emanated from this moral argument. And the truth is, the drugs are not the problem. And I'm not arguing that drugs are good. I'm not arguing that everybody should take drugs. I mean, that's, that's a separate issue to me. But this illegal thing that we've done is wrecking our country. It is fundamentally wrecking our country. You know, if American farmers were allowed to grow coca and poppies and marijuana, the Taliban would be defunded. Right now we're funding both sides of the war. You know, the heroin users are funding the Taliban and our taxes are, pay, are funding the military. Uh, the Mexican drug war, Thousands of people getting killed down there because of, of drugs flowing up through Mexico. We could defund that one. We could defund the prison industry. We could go to treatment. Portugal, in 2000, saw the light. Portugal legalized personal use, or totally decriminalized. I don't, I don't know what, what their terms are there. They still go after big dealers, but they just let people use what they use. Drug use has gone down. Attendance at treatment centers has gone up and petty crime has dropped radically because people don't need to steal to support a legal drug habit. How many people you know, have, have gang fights over cigarettes? <laughs> <laughs> or uh, who, how many people steal to support an alcohol habit? I guess a lot of people beg to support alcohol habits, and we see street people begging, but, but the legal drugs our control, we, we know the dosages. I just heard about some guys in Mexico who've been caught lately who were cutting heroin with some kind of other drug which killed some people in the United States and they just busted these people for murder. I think it happened in 2005. All of that stuff is a result of us being sold a bill of goods, it seems to me. Another way that, um, and so that's my little bomb about, about drugs. And we'll see how that goes. The, the, the depression cured prohibition of alcohol. Um, we tried it for 10 years. It wasn't working. Everybody who wanted alcohol got it. The, the Jews were allowed to have it for religious purposes. So a number of Jewish organizations controlled wine sales, uh, Manischewitz and all that. And then um, the Catholics were allowed to have wine. And so they got big into the wine business. And, and uh, priests and rabbis became very popular during Prohibition. <laughs> <laughs> had a lot of friends. Uh, and then after Prohibition, well, with the Depression, the government needed more tax money. Things were, you know, in bad shape. And one of the main reason that it got through Congress to eliminate uh, Prohibition was they needed the tax money. Well, we're seeing that now in California. Um, it was pretty astonishing to me being in Denver a few weeks ago. That's one of the states that has legal medical marijuana now. And like the, the newspapers, the weeklies, uh, are like
like the independent here, page after page of ads. It's just amazing. It, it, um, and doctors advertising. You can get a prescription very easily if you come to my office and all that. Thing. And um, they're talking about billions of dollars of, of trade going on. You know, and I think that's that's probably going to happen. Uh, it, this whole Great Recession could very easily trigger that. And I think we'd be way better off. Uh, regulated drug trade would be safer, more controlled. You know, in fact, uh, surveys of high school kids say alcohol is harder to get than most other drugs because somebody has, has the other ones in the locker down the hall or in their bedroom, um, whereas alcohol, you have to have a fake ID at a minimum. Okay, I'm going to move on to something else here. Uh, another way that, we, that religious belief affects us is in our dietary choices. And uh, in researching this book, I, I was really astonished. I knew there were some dietary, there were some that are pretty obvious. Pork, for instance. Um, Muslims and Jews don't eat pork. That's something we're all fairly familiar with, that kind of a dietary choice. Um, Vietnamese eat cats. Uh, we don't. I mean, that's sort of, the, I'd say very few of you have ever probably eaten a cat. Uh, most cultures don't eat dogs, um, but the Chinese, and Vietnamese to some degree, sometimes Mexicans, and especially in times of hunger. Um, Vietnamese eat two kinds of rats, uh, and Thais do. There's Kurds who won't eat lettuce. Um, the, the ways we weave our dietary choices all stem from various levels of belief. You probably know vegetarians around town, maybe some vegans. Um, for various reasons, people become vegans. You might know um, Macrobioticists who have a belief in whatever that is. Don't eat, I eat big things. I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, omnivores, uh, carnivores. What we, there, we have all these different levels, and we all do it because we're based on our beliefs. Some of us base those beliefs on medical evidence, uh, say low fat, low salt diet is good for high blood pressure, uh, that sort of thing. But however we arrive at it, we, our beliefs kind of let us sort of justify. Like, I was a vegan for eight years, not so much because of the animal rights piece, although I bought into that, as the environmental piece, that um, meat has a much bigger uh, carbon footprint. Um, I finally came around to local, because actually local food is a lower carbon footprint than lettuce from California. But again, it's, it's, I'm shuffling that based on my beliefs. The interesting thing, the, the one that really grabbed me, um, that was the core of this, is our relationship to cetaceans, uh, the whales and porpoises and dolphins in the world, who have much bigger brains than we do. I mean, some whales have brains five times the size of ours. They're equally convoluted brains to ours. They have the same spindle neurons, which in humans are connected with higher consciousness. Uh, they have language. Um, it's becoming apparent linguists who are studying whale song have found that, that um, the shape of, of the language bears, if, you, if it's, it's slowed down, apparently because water conveys sound faster, but they're, they're seeing the same kind of patterns of speech that are in human speech. So there's something going on there. And it stands to reason, if, if our complicated spindle neuron you know, brains and everything do everything we do, uh, probably whales and dolphins are doing something similar. Of course, they don't have opposable thumbs. Uh, so they don't build things. I think if, if you were in a flying saucer, if you were an alien coming to Earth and <coughs> circling the Earth and looking down, you'd see that there were, there were smart mammals who build things and smart mammals who sing about things. <laughs> but, but our relationship to whales has been really, really interesting. Uh, at one time, whaling was the biggest, the fifth biggest industry in America. We lit our cities with whale oil at one point. Uh, all of the cities had whale oil lamps, and we were slaughtering them at a tremendous rate. And had we not discovered petroleum that was easily accessible in, Phil in, P in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania crude, we would have killed all the whales. Oil saved the whales, actually. And, and one of the kind of a, a sidebar about whale falls in this title, as long as I'm going to detour here. Uh, whale falls were only discovered in 1989. Whale falls are the carcasses of whales that fall to the deepest, deepest depths of the ocean, 6,000 feet down. And uh, the Bathyscaphe Alvin 
was on a dive and discovered the first one that had been discovered, it turns out that when whales go that deep, and when they're dead, um, they decay for 100 years. There's still little oxygen there. Uh, and wholly new life forms have been discovered because in the absence of oxygen, the fats are rendered to methane, and there's organisms that eat methane gas. And uh, some scientists are saying that if, if global climate change gets into a runaway situation, where it really, like we start releasing all the methane in the tundra, it may be possible to take these organisms and inject them into the upper atmosphere and have them eat the methane. Because methane's, although there's less methane, it's a more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. And so that whole circularity thing I thought was kind of interesting. We, our, our dependence on, on liquid fuels started with whales. And here is a possible solution to our dependence on fossil fuels uh, that might come from them. And I thought that was kind of just an interesting potential circularity, which became a neat metaphor for me in, in this story. But going back to, the, to whales and consciousness, it's, you know, it's, it's really impossible to connect <laughs> to what a whale might think. <coughs> because here it's something that's grown up and evolved for a long time in weightlessness. Huge animals that are weightless, no technology. It's an oral culture, if there's, if there's a culture there. And they think, the more and more they're thinking there is, because they're finding differences between different groups of the same kind of whales, different behavior patterns and stuff. Uh, but how can we relate to something with, without an opposable thumb? It's never, nothing, no right angle geometry. <coughs> and, and yet, a lot of people in the late part of the last century and now want to save the whales. I mean, there's, there's a growing awareness among environmentalists and people who are, are thinking about consciousness that, that these animals are worth protecting. Just this week, um, the Ukraine, somebody in the Ukraine proposed that they um, grant them citizenship, grant uh, dolphins citizenship because their brains are as complicated as human. And um, how can we deny them rights? Interesting argument, I don't know where that one's gonna go. And yet, and yet, in March of this year, The Hump, a sushi restaurant in California, was busted for selling whale meat in contravention of the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So there's still Americans who think of whale as sushi and not as intelligent beings. I don't know if y'all have seen the movie The Cove. Um, the Cove is a story about the Japanese who catch dolphins for the theme parks. One of the things that SeaWorld and all those others don't like you to know is that the dolphins don't live very long. They, um, you're living in a concrete swimming pool when they're used to roaming thousands of miles. They don't eat well and they die. And so they're constantly replacing them. And in Taiji, Japan, they herd thousands of, or hundreds of dolphins at a time into a cove, pick out the young ones that are trainable, and slaughter the rest of them. Put them on the market as whale meat, because the Japanese don't believe they eat whale, uh, excuse me, don't believe they eat dolphin. And yet, in the course of this movie, you find out they've done DNA analysis of whale meat from Japanese shells, and it turns out to be dolphin. It's a, it's a wrenching movie about slaughter of wildlife. And and um, thinking about animals that are putatively, I mean, depending on your take on it, they're intelligent, as intelligent as us, although in a different way. And I really raise this question for me about where do we draw the line on consciousness? You know, we used to draw it along racial lines. You know, the racism <coughs> runs deep among human beings. We, we really, you know, we treated some humans as less than human. We were willing to enslave some humans. We were willing to kill some humans. We were willing to label some humans as gooks or towel heads or whatever it was we decided to call them and make them less than us and be willing to kill them. And, and to me, that consideration of consciousness is huge. If we begin to believe that we are all equal, that we all are human beings, that we share a humanity, how can we kill each other? It, how can we possibly kill each other? And then extend the question a little further. If there's an animal that's as smart as we are, if there's a chimpanzee or a bonobo that shares 97% of our DNA, that we can transfuse blood from what from them to us. Are they a food animal? Or are they a conscious animal? Where do we draw the line? Last year at De Gaulle Airport alone, 
thousands of pounds of bush meat were found being imported into France. The expatriate African population in Europe still likes to eat bush meat. Um, great green gob, so greasy grindy gopher guts, you know. <laughs> it's what mom served you, you know. So um, they're importing gorilla hands and bonobo and, and other animals from in, in great quantities because they're still being eaten. And I wonder, you know, uh, how fast is humanity going to develop a more, a, a more, a deeper consciousness about that sort of thing? And so another area that uh, you know, food and the food choices and how we treat animals are another part of our consciousness question, a part of our faith question. What do we believe? Because that's what it comes down to. I mean, you can do all the science in the world, but it still comes down to what do you believe? Is a blue whale as smart as I am? Is a blue whale an, a co-equal earthling with me? Of course, another area where we, where we really let uh, belief get in our way is the one I started with. We elect public officials who have imaginary friends. And it's pretty scary. Um, French President Jacques Chirac wrote a, a uh, autobiography after he got out of office. And he was reflecting about when George Bush was trying to recruit France as part of the coalition of the willing to go into Iraq. And this is what uh, Chirac wrote. That George W. Bush told him, quote, Gog and Magog conflict to erase his people's enemies before a new age begins. So George Bush was solving a religious problem when he went in after the illusory WMDs that he couldn't find under the tables and everything. You know, he was, it was a religious war, as he pretty much admitted. Uh, I mean, he, he, he called it the crusade from the outset. And, and yet, here we have another you know, world leader saying that this guy was actually saying this. I mean, this isn't just something he said on Sunday, in Sunday school. This is where, this is what was leading George Bush. And, of course, Billy Graham was always there. From the reason I called the reason I called this political biography of Billy Graham um, the Prince of War is partly a play on the Prince of Peace. But what what happened was in 2002, I was still an investigative reporter, and um, there was a story in the newspaper, an AP story about Billy Graham. Uh, some Nixon tapes had been released. And it showed Billy Graham trashing the Jews. He said that they were satanic Jews who were wrecking our country. And it was only a couple of paragraphs, but I knew I'd been a writer long enough to know that, that a two paragraph AP story had more going on behind it. So I got a copy of the transcript of that. It was an hour and a half conversation. And Billy Graham was leading it. He wasn't just going, yeah, Mr. Nixon, oh yeah, that's Mr. President. You know, he was, he was actually leading it, talking about the satanic Jews, talking about the terrible damage they were doing. And ominously, this was before the 72 election. I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember that. Um, Nixon won again in 72. Watergate had occurred before that and then took him down after that, but he won that election. This was just before the 72 election. Graham was saying, after you're reelected, maybe we can do something about that, about the Jews. Well, I, I thought, whoa, <laughs> this isn't the spiritual advice that, that I always heard Billy Graham gave the presidents. You know, we hear he, he goes there for a national day of prayer, um, which he helped start. And so I went to all the presidential libraries, or got information from them. I didn't go to every one of them, but I, and I went to the Billy Graham Library in Wheaton, Illinois. And started digging into what did Billy really say to the presidents. It turns out that since Truman, he's been advising presidents to go to war. He urged Truman to go into Korea before we had a Korean issue, before, before it blew up, which Truman finally did go into Korea, but before that happened, Graham was on his case to go into Korea. He said, there are more Christians per capita in Korea than anywhere else in the world. Well, that wasn't true then, and it isn't true now. <laughs> But Billy Graham's really good at making up stories. Then, under Eisenhower, he urged Eisenhower into, into China. And he may have been part of the machinations that got uh, Eisenhower to displace the head of uh, the South Vietnam time. I'm skipping the guy's name right now, but we put a CIA 
uh, plant in there in charge of the South Vietnamese government, but mostly Eisenhower ignored him. Kennedy, uh, Graham was not um, on real good terms because he started the anti-Catholic thing from Switzerland. He organized the anti-Catholic move trying to tell the press that, that Kennedy would make the U.S. servile to the Vatican. Because that's, that sounds just like, you know, they're talking about Obama is going to make us all Muslims. But it was the same kind of thing. But, um, so Graham had started that, and Kennedy didn't like him for that. But Kennedy wasn't in office long. And under Johnson, uh, he really pushed the Viet Vietnamese War. Uh, in fact, R Lyndon Johnson's bombing campaign of North Vietnam was called, the, the carpet bombing was called Rolling Thunder. <coughs> That's taken from Billy Graham's theme song. Um, under Nixon, he continued his support for the Vietnamese War. In fact, he urged Nixon to commit genocide in Vietnam. He tried to get Nixon to, to bomb the dikes in North Vietnam, which would have drowned million, upward of a million people. We, we hung Germans for bombing dikes. It's a war crime. Nixon wouldn't listen to him. He went to Kissinger. He went to Melvin Laird with the same thing. You've got to bomb the dikes in North Vietnam. And on and on and on, until when, when George W. Bush declared war from the National Cathedral after 9-11, Billy Graham was there. He really has led us into war over and over and over again. That's been his drumbeat, believing, and he has a reason, he thinks that American armies will Christianize the world. And so, again, belief, in my view, has been subverted to political ends. Billy Graham's heavily invested in, in arms companies and oil companies. His big backers were big bankers, big arms manufacturers, big oil companies who put the money. Rockefellers were big money for him. Um, and when I see this over and over again, we, they, when they use faith to sucker us, to sucker the population into, into saying this is a moral reason to go along with this. Send a few bucks to Billy Graham. He's going to save you. You know, you're going to get your ticket to heaven. And whether they're offering him, you know, a, a mansion in the sky or not, 72 virgins, it doesn't matter what the religion is. They, they, they sucker us for other reasons. And that's the thing that I think is so poisonous. It's the way that belief is subverted. Because, you know, we all, we all get scared. You know, you, you and I have found a more rational basis, we think, you know, and I, I don't know, I, I, um, I don't know if someday I'm facing terminal, <coughs> something terminal, you know, will, will I hold up? Christopher Hitchens is, you know, I mean, he's, he's, he's in a bad way, and he hasn't gone back on, on his non-belief. And yet, there's a lot of comfort in being promised magic, <coughs> whether it's a magic pill, or a magic <coughs> wand, or a magic ceremony, or an intercession with God. It's a powerful thing for we poor, scared people who, you know, we, 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 we hurt, we are hurt, we suffer, we, we suffer financial losses, we suffer personal losses, we have broken loves, we have broken hearts, and we are really easy to sell a bill of goods to. Um, and that's why I think it's so important that we do good without God and show people that that's where good comes from. The golden rule comes from the animal world. We didn't make it up. Animals that cooperate survive. You know, we, you don't hear much about cannibalism in the world. It, it doesn't work. That's, a, that's one of the, like, the major dietary agreements in the world. Most people don't eat people, because it's very self-limiting. <laughs> um, but animals cooperate. Animals that do cooperate survive. Chimpanzees that get ostracized from their tribes die. Human beings, very few human beings survive alone. No matter what the, uh, the corporate people who say, oh, everybody, you know, that's on your own. You can make it yourself, you know. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps and don't use the public highways. Don't use the public water systems. Don't depend on clean food and clean water and schools. Don't, you know, don't live in an educated community. We depend on each other so much. That's why we have to teach truth in the schools, not, not creationism. Science, so our kids learn science. Speaking of science, I almost didn't make it here tonight. Um, and I'll close with this, I guess. I jumped in my car. I left an hour and a half slack because I didn't. I haven't been to Raleigh for about four years. And amazingly, I didn't know where Wade Avenue was. Um, I mean, when I, I see it on the highway, it's like, oh well, wow, <laughs> it's half the highway. 
Um, <laughs> um, so I jumped, I have a Prius, I jumped in the Prius and nothing happened. This, the panel starts blinking at me. What? What? And I thought of praying, but no. <laughs> um, I pulled my laptop out, it was next to my house, so I still had my Wi-Fi, and I looked up a troubleshooting thing, found out that it was the battery in the key, the, the key thing, so I borrowed a friend's car, ran to the thing, to the store, got a battery, came back, started the car, but it, it had taken almost that whole hour and a half slack I had, so I was getting really worried. I punched my GPS, and it didn't know where Wade Avenue was. It, it wouldn't let me punch in Raleigh. I mean, it, it, it insisted that the only Wades were in other R towns around the country. <laughs> there was nothing in Raleigh. So fortunately, I had my smartphone, and my smartphone knew where you were. <laughs> um, and that's the kind of thing, you know, we're making our lives much easier because of science. We're living longer, we're, we're working more efficiently, we're, you know, we're spending hours on Facebook, and, um, but we're doing, we're doing a whole lot of good because the human mind is really powerful and we get together and we have books that continue wisdom through the ages and we have, now we have networks that connect human thinking around the globe. You know, we're solving problems between people on all, on all seven continents, I guess, at this point. And, and it's that power of our imagination and our wisdom that is our, sa it's our salvation. That's where it comes from. It's not handed down from somewhere else. It's not magic. Thank you for listening. If you have any discussion, I'd be happy to talk with you. I'd be happy to sell you some books. Too. <laughs>
He's got Samaritan's Purse Canada, Samaritan's Purse in Europe somewhere, and, and another one in Africa. And he shuffles money between them. And I suspect, if I ever have time to write another investigative biography of a religious character, I'm gonna pick him, and I'd like to go after his books. Because I, I suspect that they shuffle a lot of money. Meanwhile, Billy lives in his little log cabin up in Montreal with an indoor swimming pool, widescreen TV, helicopter pad outside. You know, it's a nice log cabin, though. Yeah. Uh, I've heard it before, uh, probably not as uh, African American, done so with Chinese and Mexicans, which is borders to the Southwest. Kind of Washington take it over. But the idea, I believe the Obama administration said it in the People who obey, obey the state law in so many states now, more than I ever realized, I realized apparently piling out from the new taxes, which prospects me. And I don't know what's going to happen. I was surprised that maybe this thing will ever balance and somebody will be the tax return and then they're going to give people some problems. Yeah. Eleven states have legalized medical marijuana now. And, um, and they're taxing it, and it's, it's substantial. And it's amazing. I, um, as I said, being in Denver, it's, apparently you can just walk in and get a prescription. I mean, a guy got it for writer's cramp. Wow, I that. Get it for writer's block. <laughs> what? Get it for writer's block. What? <laughs> <laughs> it would seem to me, if there is a God that made this whole thing so that some animal species on Earth could be rewarded, wouldn't it be whales and dolphins and not humans? If, if, I mean, if there was a God that made the universe and made the Earth so that a species of animal could be rewarded for being good, oh, wouldn't it be the whales and... You know, it's, I'm three years out from re-election, from if I run again. Um, as the four-year term. I was just, our paper, like your independent here, has an annual reader's poll that, you know, people vote for the best ice cream and the best, and I got best local hero and best politician this year. Yay. With the Mountain <laughs> Spurs. I'm a real hands-on person. I'm not trying to brag, but I, I just, I believe in doing things. I, I organized a sidewalk cleanup thing this year. Got people out in the, in the streets cleaning where things were overgrown, sidewalks are blocked and stuff. So I'm, I'm visible in the community doing things. I do a jail ministry for the youth, through the UU church. I help with homeless uh, things. I think people have begun to understand that my religious beliefs don't preclude me being an active community member. And, and so I suspect I would have a pretty good shot at reelection. Asheville is a little different. Um, Asheville is not Buncombe County, for instance. Um, our county is much more conservative than our city, and our county is much larger. We are 270,000 in the county and only 80,000 in, in the city. In fact, the, a more, more backstory is that I ran for county commission in 2008 in the Obama primary, and I lost by 0.8% to a 20-year incumbent in the county. Wow. And and I thought, you know, I'm through with politics. <laughs> Not going to go there again. And then a friend of mine did the numbers. He said, you know, you, you cleaned up in the city. Why don't you run for city council? <clears throat> okay. So, um, and, and partly, I've been there. I've been in the county 30 years. I've I've got a pretty good reputation as an investigative reporter for taking down the sheriff. Um, so I, there are things going for me that if I were just, if I were a less known person to begin with. And then labeled atheist, I, you know that might not work. I've been encouraged by a number of people to run in the primary uh, against Heath Schuler. We have a blue dog um, in our district, and I, that would be an interesting test because I would I wouldn't be surprised if I could beat him in Buncombe County because um, an unknown beat him in the primary this last year, who had no money in his campaign, nobody ever heard his name before, and he beat him in Buncombe. But our district is much bigger and is very conservative. So I don't know if it would help to pull Schuler back in, you know, to the Democratic Party or not. Um, and it, it is a tough thing. It is, I mean, I think I, I would not underestimate that, especially in the South, maybe. I mean, we're more, 
more more visibly Christian down here than other parts of the country. That that announcing it, um, announcing atheism, non-theism, non-church attendance probably would hurt your chances. But I'm, I mean, I'm, I think. It's good for people to run. You probably heard about Herb Silverman down in South Carolina, um, who ran for governor there a couple of times uh, as an open atheist. And he just got the issue out. And finally, he, he lost the primary, but he decided to become a notary and went all the way to the Supreme Court to become a notary in South Carolina because South Carolina has the same law we do. You can't hold public office if, you, um, if you're an atheist. So I think it's a good thing to do. I don't know if it's a winning thing to do. Maybe you know, it's, it's one more way to show that we're just like every you know, <clears throat> we want good communities. Yeah. What do you think of the possible counterattack? Like you know, with all these extremists, like religious zealots out there, they're running for office, and you know, like with Bush, he turned out to be I don't know, what you call a Zionist or someone believing in this impending apocalypse, I mean, that was something to be concerned about, you know, that really affects their actions, and, you know, they're not going to be acting for the betterment of the entire society who think the world's going to end pretty soon, and they can start their own war, thinking that's a sign from God, you know, that's what Bush did, and, and so is that, like, would we, we even want to have some kind of litmus test for that, could we even challenge people, you know, you know, for that kind of thinking? That's not a bad idea. Um, under Reagan, the Secretary of Interior, <coughs> James Watt, Watt, yeah, Watt, Watt. yeah. Um, didn't believe we needed to protect our national parks because the the uh, um, apocalypse was near. Brett, <laughs> <laughs> why aren't we talking about that? Yeah. You have, uh, you may ask, I don't know, does anybody in Ukraine or anywhere think that uh, dolphins would like to be citizens? Would <laughs> like to be citizens. <laughs> Maybe they pulled them. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I had a question since you said that I think only one open congressman in, in, in the United States. But I wonder if you've been approached by others who are not open but have said, hey, you know, I am, but I can't be open yet. But that to get a feel for what what really is the percent of my content issues that we have in, in Congress, where some of them have approached you open. I've had four. Um, from Buncombe County come to me from different cities um, including there's a guy on my council who um, he just says I just I don't talk about it you know, he's he just um, and he was surprised they didn't pick up on it but he's just never made any public statement whereas you know I mean, that, that was the only place I had ever made a public statement and they just happened to dig that up but there's um, in three other cities in, the, in our county guys have come to me and said I feel the same way, but I'm not going to go there publicly. So I, I think there are. I think there are a lot more quiet agnostics and non-theists and atheists and free thinkers, ethicists than, than we see in, in public. Yeah. It seems like this is just a, a, a thought, not a question, but it's interesting that they bothered to dig that up. And by adding you as a non-believer, they've actually created an activist. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> That's why I said it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, it's been so cool to get out and meet groups all over the country now and, and have more, um, you know, coming up and universities who want, like Elon, <clears throat> Elon University in February, no, <clears throat> April 4th <clears throat> is doing a panel on atheism. It's not as a baby, but they're, you know, doing three of us up there. And the religious studies at UNC Charlotte, the same thing. They had me speak about non-believers in office. <clears throat> so we're, I think we're making inroads that way. Back to talking about taxes, um, I think the point that if, if we legalize marijuana, we have a tax base that <clears throat> might help pull our economy out of the doldrums. How about if we start taxing churches? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Buncombe County is, uh, has this huge swath owned by Billy Graham, so it's off the tax rolls, you know, and especially, yeah, the, I mean, everything, everything. especially the politically active ones, I think we can make a really strong case. I mean, because they, they're absolutely violating the law there already. But I agree. I mean, why are we having to support them? 
why do I have to pay more taxes in Buncombe to support Billy Graham's ministry? It ain't right. You know, on that note, uh, why isn't atheism a religion? And treat it as such. Why, does it? why isn't atheism a religion and treat it as such for, ta for tax purposes? Because if I have a conversation with a believer, they're one of the arguments that comes up is the fact that uh, atheism is just as much a belief as the belief in a deity. There's not really substantiated because mathematically speaking, you can't really prove, or you can't really disprove, just like with the spaghetti monster, right? Right. You can't disprove his existence. Right. I think there's two answers there. One is, if you form a group, you can become tax exempt, like the Ethical Society is, or Freedom from Religion Foundation, or you know, you can, you can form a nonprofit. But the other thing is that atheism, I mean, although we get labeled as if it were a thing, it's really not a thing. It's not theism, you know, it's, it's I mean, I, I never considered God a really, from the time I was 15, although by 20, which you had in your intro for me, Amy, um, by 20 I was clearly out of the woods. But even at age 15, I, it was just not a relevant question to me, which is why I told the press when they first got after me that I was a post-theist. I had thought of myself as post-theist. Like, I grew up in a world where God was not an issue. And um, it's like God is not an interesting question, even. So it's hard to make a religion around that. A, a what? <laughs> a religion might be too, too much. Right. But Mark will mute that. Just a quick point on that. There's actually two national organizations that are non-theistic that I know of that are uh, registered as religions. The American Ethical Union Society for Humanistic Judaism are both actually listed, <coughs> are actually registered the RS as churches as religious organizations, even though they're non-theistic. So it's somewhat of a, it's somewhat of a choice. For example, the American Humanist Association, which the Triangle Free Thought Society is in play, used to be a religious organization for tax reasons eventually decided that for principle they were going to no longer do that so they lost some of the benefits of the church but now they're not. On this question of taxes, since everything of that religion can be used to justify their tax exempt status is based on fiction, has any attempt ever been made to challenge that in the court? He said, all right, you're going to say claim this and you get some special privileges for it. I don't know if it's ever been challenged. It's a big, it would be a logical thing to do. I think they tried it over in, in Italy recently. I heard that I heard they had uh, uh, challenged the uh, uh, somebody was challenging the uh, the Catholic Church over in Italy had a uh, raise a tr you know in, in court trying there was, to. There was a, an issue a few years ago where that uh, judge wanted to lift the tenth amendments in his court and the grave in the court of the night. I started a kind of a terminal in the Durham newspaper that I write some critique of that, saying that the use of the court is presumably based on the local previous newspaper. And it started this huge story. But interestingly, repeatedly, the people that were inventing this, including the Ten Commandments, were saying, well, you can't prove it, but you're not. I said, well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take out one more question. Or not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, do you see your atheism as an example of something bigger, like you're not superstitious, or is it just some, something separate? Um, it's not just a question of not superstitious <clears throat> for me. I think that none of the questions that religion purports to answer are answered by religion. Um, we still have the question of origins. I mean, somehow a universe happened. But whether we call it God or call it we don't know is the same answer. And, and maybe something happens, maybe we survive death. I, I doubt it, but maybe we do, but there's no way to know until we die. So either of those questions seems to me like not, and then the ethics question to me comes from the golden rule, which is based in nature. And so it's not so much not a lot, it's not so much a lack of superstition as I don't need it as an explanation for anything. To me, the world's pretty explainable. So in <coughs> other areas where you could be superstitious, whether it's Santa Claus, Easter Bunny, Jamesianism, or you know, all the other things, breaking mirrors, 
all the other things that people believe that don't have that basis in fact. Do you reject them all too, or is religion discussion? Personally, I reject them. Yeah, I mean, I don't. There's no Santa Claus. <laughs> there, is, there is a giant spaghetti monster. <laughs> it's touched me. Really <laughs> um, but I think it's fine for people to believe in those things as long as they don't try to, you know, tax me for them, make war on me for them, <clears throat> etc. The two hands shot up at the same time, so we'll take your question. I, this was more a comment. I, I think back when the humanists were a religion, I think part of that had to do with the military. My mother was a draft counselor during the Vietnam War. And part of the humanists becoming a religion had to do with the fact that their youth could then claim country and just subject their status, which had to be based on a religion. Um, and that's not so much an issue right now, but it's something to keep in mind. And just to plug for the UUs, they do take essays from their youth um, when they hit military age. My son has one on file. Should the draft ever come back? He claimed conscientious objector status through a church, Unitarian Universalism, when he turned 18. So anyone that's concerned about that for their teenagers, it, I still recommend it. Here, here. 